And if we put that score into that chart again, we can see that the estimations were bang on. So that is great to see. Last week, Apple introduced their new M1 Pro and M1 Max SoCs, which they have integrated into their new 14-inch and 16-inch MacBook Pros. And in general, there's been a ton of hype around the performance of these monstrous new chips. To quickly recap, the M1 Pro and M1 Max now each have a 10-core CPU, 8 high performance and 2 efficiency cores. The M1 Pro now has a up to 16-core GPU and the M1 Max now has an up to 32-core GPU and both utilize blazingly fast LPDDR5 memory for just astonishing amounts of memory bandwidth. In the previous video I analyzed the performance charts Apple put out of the CPU and GPU performance and also made some estimations around which level the CPU and GPU were going to be in terms of performance levels. On Monday various media outlets posted reviews of these new machines, so in this video I want to a have a look at a brief overview of the performance of the CPU and GPU and B, see if my estimations and if Apple's performance charts were correct. So let's get started. I'm going to reference data from the following reviews. Links are in the description, do check them out. First, we have Andre Frumusanu from Anantec. We have PC Mags, Tom Brandt, and Gadgets, Devendra Hardawar, Dave Lee from Dave2D, and finally, Caitlin McGarry from Gizmodo. Starting off with multi-core CPU performance versus power. This is one of the larger charts Apple put out. And we got a lot of information from it. Maybe we got three data points with M1, the i7-11850G7, and will turn out to be an i7-11800H. And from those data points and the relative performance Apple gave, we could construct what a theoretical Cinebench performance could be. And these were the numbers I came up with. So we're looking at a multi-thread performance between 11,900 and 13,527. So between a desktop Ryzen 5 5600X and a Ryzen 7 5 800X. Now, the reviews are out and the highest score from the publication I could find was PC Mac with 12,395. And if we put that score into that chart again, we can see that the estimations were bang on. So that is great to see. So, yeah, really strong multi-core performance here. Cinebench isn't everything in terms of CPU performance. So for that, we go to the Anantec review. Starting with single-threaded performance, there didn't really turn out to be any improvement over M1, but that wasn't surprising, perhaps, as M1 Pro and M1 Max share the same core architecture as M1, but just have more performance cores. And here we can indeed see that the M1 and M1 Max are virtually identical in terms of scores, still very competitive with both the best from Intel and AMD on both the mobile and desktop platform. But where the real kicker is in multi-threaded performance, where it turns out that the added bandwidth from the fast LPDDR5 memory really aided performance here. And if we see here in the multi-threaded page, and again I urge you to read this entire Anantec article, it is full of fantastic information. But if we scroll all the way down to the bottom, we can see that the 10-core M1 Max in integer performance is faster than the Ryzen 7 5800X we saw also in the Cinebench R23 scores. But in floating point performance, it is just in another league, outclassing the 12-core Ryzen 5900X and Ryzen 9 5950X, 12 and 16-core CPUs. Furthermore, there's another thing we can look at here, and that is as Anantec used Spec 2017 as their benchmark suite and also included the i7-1185G7, which Apple also used in their chart, which was the 4-core PC laptop. Now Apple here states that they used select industry standard benchmarks and as industry standard, as industry standard benchmark goes, there is really, it doesn't get much better than Spec 2017. So using this information, we can check uh, how the relative performance Apple claims comparing the i7-1185 compared to the M1 Pro Max CPU, how that compares to real tests with proper industry uh, standard tests. And the results are surprising. 
here we can see that Apple with their industry standard tests taking the 1185G7 as a baseline, the M1 Max and M1 Pro CPUs will have a performance of 204%. However, the real industry standard spec tests reveal that they are actually much faster at a 240, over 240% on the integer test and over 260% on the floating point performance, so actually much faster than even Apple claimed. So that is pretty remarkable. Moving on to GPU performance, where again Apple made some serious claims, with the M1 Max performing just a little under a 163 watt RTX 3080 mobile in an MSI machine, and way faster than an RTX 3080 at 100 watts in a Razer Blade 15. And from those numbers and relative performance figures, we could construct the following uh, possible scores where the M1 Max could perform between a uh, desktop RTX 3070 and a desktop RTX 3060. And I'd like to thank commenter following to point out that I made a small error in the previous video where now the estimations line up even better from this one and this one. In any case, the issue with that test is that 3 d Mark Time Spy isn't available for Mac, but reviewers have adapted to use GFX Bench 5, which, uh, which runs natively using the Metal API. And here the performance is impressive. We've got GFX Bench 5 from PC Mac, from a non-tech, and from Dave 2D. And again, we can see that it should be around the level of a 160 watt RTX 3080. And this did turn out to be the case. PC Mac tested against the 165 watt Alienware X17 RTX 3080. Here, the M1 Max scored 14.8% better at 310 FPS. Anantec also tested exactly um, the same machine Apple showed in their charts with a 165 watt RTX 3080. And here, the 32 core CPU is 1.8% slower at 309 FPS, so very close to what PC Mac got. And finally, Dave 2D, he tested against a 100 watt RTX 3080, again, as Apple showed, and indeed that is much faster here, around 30% faster. So we are seeing seriously impressive performance. GFX Bench is a uh, synthetic benchmark, it doesn't, it's not a pure gaming benchmark, like you would say, with. Uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, as we'll get to in a bit. But the synthetic performance here is very serious and basically on par with what Apple showed. Moving on to scaling, I'd like to go back here. Um, from the performance estimations, we could see that Apple basically gave perfect scaling, going from 5600 to 11,700 points. Basically perfect scaling. And it is very close here. Um, PC Mac had a 16 core. MacBook Pro 14, so did an Antec, and Dave 2D got a 14 core uh, M1 Pro. And here we can see that the scaling is 86.7% in the case of PC Mac, 86.5% in the case of an Antec, and strong performance from Dave 2D here at the with the 14 core um, GPU at 83.3%. Finally, we have the smallest of the bunch, the again the 16 core, which was supposedly very competitive against an RTX 3050 Ti from a Lenovo Legion. And here we can see a Nantec tested an RTX 3060 and so did Dave 2D. And here performance again is really impressive, where the 16 core and 14 core chips actually managed to beat out an RTX 3060 mobile, slightly higher than an RTX 3050 Ti mobile. In terms of real-world gaming, the reviewers tested two titles, Tomb Raider and Rise of the Tomb Raider, and these have, both have a Mac port. And the performance is way less flattering here. Both Gizmodo and Anantec and Dave 2D, um, in this case we're, see, we're looking at around a 40% performance difference now compared to here an RTX 3070, and Anantec the same RTX 3080, and uh, here for Dave 2D we have a slightly better result, but that is also because the RTX 3080 is only a 100 watt model, so the performance difference is a bit less drastic. What we're seeing here is that both Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Tomb Raider 
or x86 apps, so translations still need to happen. They aren't native ARM apps. And therefore we are seeing quite severe performance reductions. So despite the, as we've seen with GFX Bench, there is a lot of pure GPU performance on tap, uh, the optimization still needs to happen for games to utilize it. And here um, the highest 32 core GPU is just about equal with an RTX 3060 laptop. Still strong performance. Uh, what we've seen with GFX Bench, it could be a lot better. And finally, power. Here Apple made it pretty clear in their charts that their CPU will draw around 30 watts. And here again, Anantec has come to the rescue. And they measured between 34 and 43.9 watts in multi-threaded applications. Now, that is still an insane power level given the performance we have, but it's a bit more than 30 watts. Moving on to GPU, with a bit of PowerPoint creativity, I was able to make out that the GPU would draw around 57 watts of power based on their charts. And that turned out to be exactly the case, as Andre from Anantec measured a package power of 56.8 watts with the Aztec Synthetic GPU benchmark. So again, that is great to see and an insane power level for their GPU, given the amount of horsepower it has. That was quite a lot of information, but man, these chips are impressive. In terms of single thread performance, we haven't seen a big shift, but that was already strong to begin with, but especially the multi-threaded score. And considering at that performance level, it competes with products that consume two, three times as much power. And on the GPU side, it's the same story, where it successfully competes in synthetic tests against a 160 watt RTX 3080, while using itself 57 watts of power. So that is just insane, but an asterisk there is that developers do need to step up and uh, build games that run natively on ARM, so all of that processing power can be put to good use. I've also been very happy to see that the estimations were very good, uh, in terms of the estimation I made for Siemens R23, but also that we've seen with the spec test that actually Apple has been a bit conservative in their multi-core performance metrics. The same is sort of true for a GPU. We now see that in a synthetic test, it can certainly hold up against an RTX 3080, but still, as I just said, a lot of work needs to happen for games to fully utilize it. Well, we've covered a lot today, and I hope you have enjoyed it, and if you did, a like would be much appreciated. And if you want to be kept up to date on future videos, why not consider subscribing to the Fully Buffered channel? And please leave in the comments, what do you think of these chips? Do leave a comment below. Well, that was all for now, and bye-bye.